For Cremo Media's Polity, I'm Sashni Mali. Joining me today are sexualities and reproduction researchers Hilandi Duplessis and Katrina McLeod, here to discuss their book, Abortion Services and Reproductive Justice in Rural South Africa. Your book examines the persistent challenges facing women in rural areas when it comes to reproductive health rights, and this despite South Africa having progressive abortion legislation. Can you give our viewers a brief history of the fight for abortion rights in South Africa, both in law and in practice? During a pre-apartheid time, abortion was governed by common law that was inherited from various colonial kind of dispensations. And so it was illegal at that time, except where pregnancy posed a risk to a woman's life. But in about 1973, there were calls made from doctors specifically for clarity on the law because they were a bit worried about being prosecuted for doing abortions and they didn't know what the legal parameters were. And also there were concerns that uh, post-abortion care for unsafe abortions was using up hospitals' gynecological budgets. So in 1973, there was a committee set up actually and ironically consisted only of white men who did an investigation and there were recommendations made. And that led to the Abortion and Sterilization Act, which was passed in 1976. And it, in fact, actually liberalized the conditions under which abortion could be obtained. So it was not only the threat of the woman's life, but also in cases of severe fetal abnormality, rape, incest, as well as when a pregnant woman was deemed to be, and we put inverted commas here, in mentally incompetent. So it sounds as if like more was happening in terms of the law, but the requirements were very prohibitive and quite stringent for actually accessing legal abortion. So, for example, you had to get the consent of three doctors. And so the fact that these requirements were so uh, stringent meant that you needed to have quite a lot of time and resources to be able to access legal abortion. So most of the people who did, and there were very few that were actually performed, were, you know, at that stage, mostly white women who had the, the resources to be able to go through those lengthy and rather stringent processes. With the transition to democracy, there was two major groups that advocated for legislation to be uh, more progressive and women-focused. And that was from public health specialists who showed the enormous costs that were being carried by the public health system in terms of dealing with incomplete abortions from unsafe abortions. And so that was the one, there was lots of research that was being done that was showing the real health complications that people were facing from what is really preventable, unsafe abortions. And then on the other hand, you had reproductive right advocates, which in the feelings of the time around moving towards a democratic state and a rights-based sort of state interventions, there were reproductive right advocates that pushed for new legislation. And so then we got the CTAP Act, which was passed in 1996. It's seen as very progressive legislation. So people, including minors, are able to request abortion up to the 12th week of gestation and thereafter under specified conditions. And those conditions are actually quite broad, including that it will affect the socioeconomic status of the person. Since then, there were three legal challenges to the CTOP. The initial one was for the entire act to be thrown out on the basis that it was unconstitutional. The second one was about the clause on minors being able to request an abortion without parental or guardian permission or even talking to them. And then the third one was in relation to an amendment of the act which extended who may provide services. The first of these were just thrown out. Uh, they failed. But the third one, the state was told to go back and do more public consultation, which they did, and then the Amendment Act passed. So that's the legal situation. Essentially, we've got really good legislation. The problem in practice, there are many, many challenges in service delivery, including lack of facilities, negative staff attitudes, social stigma, proliferation of illegal advertising, lack of political will. And so that has led to, despite our really good legislation, 
there are estimates that in fact about 50% of our abortions are still performed under illegal conditions. Now, of course, we must remember that illegal doesn't necessarily mean unsafe, although they are often more unsafe. But yeah, so not everybody is actually accessing legal abortions, which is their right. Now, your research comes from a study in the Eastern Cape between 2019 and 2020. So tell us why you chose to study districts in this province and what were some of the challenges that you came across while conducting your research? So the study was initially commissioned by Mari Stoke. They wanted to extend their services to rural areas in the Eastern Cape specifically. So that was why the the province was selected. So the book is based on the research that we conducted for Maori Stopes, but you know we've made it obviously much broader than what Maori we spoke generally about in the book, at least about uh, abortion services in general. What we did to kind of acknowledge the diversity of rurality and what it means, we selected three quite different rural areas to be able to capture some of that diversity. So the first place that we conducted our research was in commercial farmlands. And this is where most of the people who are living there are farm laborers who live on the commercial farmer's land or else in a small township near the the commercial farmers and they commute each day onto the land to work. So that was the one area. The other one is quite a remote area in the former Transkei. It consists of hundreds of homesteads spread out over a large area that are divided into four villages. Then the third site was less remote in the former Transkei areas, also consisting of a sizable form of communal land, but surrounding a small town. So there is better access to a town than in the remote area in the former Transkei. What kind of shows you the difference in these areas is how the clinics operate. So in the remote area, there's a clinic there that's run actually by an NGO, because the closest government clinic is very far and you have to cross a river to get there. So they're actually quite lucky to have that NGO in the area doing that because many of those more remote areas would not have an NGO clinic. In the uh, one surrounding the town, the clinic is in the town, whereas in the commercial farming area, mobile clinic that goes around and visits the farms. So slightly different access to services as well. In terms of going in to conduct the research, we didn't find major challenges in two of the sites because we partnered with the NGOs that are working in the area. And so that was an important part of gaining access. And we used some of the community health workers, for example, to help us with data collection. And we're about to go back into those areas to go and share the findings and to feed back the results into the areas where we collected the data. So that wasn't too bad. The main challenge was more in the commercial farming areas where people are scattered all over the place. And sometimes farmers were not happy with us to go onto farms, etc. So we had to meet them outside of their workplaces. But generally, data collection actually ran relatively smoothly. Now, can you talk to us about the possibility of political interference? Because your book reveals that South Africa relies quite heavily on outside funds for HIV and other reproductive health prevention efforts. So what you are referring to there is a lot of our funding for particularly HIV work, and and obviously HIV work also goes along with other sexual and reproductive health services, and we, we do rely heavily on external funds, and where the political interference, although I think the politicians may disagree, it comes from what is sort of generically referred to as the global gag rule. It has different names, but basically in the United States, each time a Republican president comes in, they sign what's you know generically called the global gag rule. And the latest version signed by Donald Trump, it was called Protecting Life and Global Health Assistance. But basically what this piece of legislation does, it means that organizations, say in South Africa, NGOs that are receiving U.S. government aid money, 
um, may not provide or even promote abortions. So, for example, if you perhaps have an HIV clinic, um, you are not allowed to even refer or even talk about abortion when people are coming to, to access your services. And although this is not supposed to apply to governments themselves, actual government initiatives, um, there is evidence that actually it has a chilling effect on what governments do. And sometimes there's misinterpretation and, and over-interpretation of what the global gag rule means. We find silence, we find ignorance, and we find avoidance to actually engage with the implications of what the government is doing and how it is responding to the stipulations of the global gag rule. And Ilandi, what did you find were communities' attitudes towards abortion? Were there strong pro- and anti-abortion sentiments? There were some inaccurate information about what an abortion entails um, and about the different types of abortions and what the time frames are that you can have it. But most people knew that at least abortion was legal and that it's probably best to have one in a government facility. But a lot of the knowledge about abortion in these areas were tainted by decades of use of informal or unsafe abortion practices due to people not having access to safe and legal abortion. Um, in the more rural areas, when our interviewees were asked about abortion, the first image that comes up for them is that of the use of abortifacients or concoctions that induce abortion that is provided by traditional healers or recipes that, you know, are recommended by friends and that uses household products like bleach or uh, steel wool. So these concoctions are often toxic and dangerous and many people had stories about how someone died or almost died and is now infertile. In areas where that has a bit more of access to cities, it's not really traditional healers, but backstreet abortionists that cause people to die and become infertile. So abortion is heavily associated with infertility and death in these areas. To have an abortion, as uh, several participants said, is really to have a death wish. And this is often what was being said. But of course, when you specifically asked to talk about abortions in the public health sector, you know, people understood that this is probably the safer, or at least the safer, you know, op option. As for attitudes towards abortion, what was interesting regarding the interviews is that people would often start off saying very negative things about abortions. These were, you know, the basic arguments against whether it's religious or the idea that it is murder or the fact that it's dangerous to your health. But as the interview goes on, the participants would often, unprobed, start questioning their own attitudes and start sympathizing with women who might want an abortion. And they start talking about the difficulties of being an unemployed mother. They start talking about how men often abandon their girlfriends when they become pregnant. Uh, they start talking about how difficult it is to get antenatal care appointments or even to you know, give birth when you live in rural areas, especially when you don't have money and transport. Almost always the argument was made that the abortion is acceptable in certain circumstances, especially if the woman has been raped. But, you know, the aim of our study was to find out what people's preferences in service delivery would be with regards to abortion. So we asked our participants to put themselves in the shoes of someone that needs an abortion. And that exercise of empathy actually had an interesting effect on participants' attitudes towards abortion. And was there an effect or what effects does stigma have on the access to safe abortions? Well, abortion stigma has a significant effect on women accessing their basic reproductive rights. In asking people what their preferences are for abortion services, apart from affordability, because we were talking to poor unemployed people, the issue of maintaining confidentiality was almost always the most important. If there was an abortion clinic right next door to them, Participants said that they would not use it if it meant that someone might see them. They would choose the unsafe or even costlier method if it meant that they would not be identified by people they know to be going for an abortion. 
So yes, the stigma attached to abortion has a significant effect on access and this effect compounds the poorer you are and the more rural you are. So for women to enjoy the full range of their reproductive rights, yes, reducing abortion stigma is really important. And your book outlines a conceptual framework for the kind of stigma that surrounds abortion. Can you briefly just tell us a bit about this? Well, to have a stigma attached to you means you are discredited or marked due to something particular about you or something you did. Some of these marks are visible, like disabilities. Others, like abortion stigma, is invisible. Abortion stigma is built on the idea that only very specific types of women abort. These women are not good women. They are not real women. Real women would desire and love their babies no matter how difficult their lives are. Real women would do anything to protect their babies. So to be known to have had an abortion is to be associated with this type of discredited woman. You are expected to feel ashamed of what you did. So women who abort tend not to tell anyone about it. Now, abortion stigma is only able to remain in place because of the claim that abortions are not normal, that abortions are done very infrequently. Abortion stigma relies on the idea that abortions occur very rarely, and when it does, there are serious consequences. And this image is meant to scare women off of having an abortion. What it does, however, is it drives abortion underground, where people feel like they won't be found out, and that often means getting an unsafe abortion. But the fact is that over 73 million abortions occur worldwide each year. It is estimated that a quarter of all pregnancies in sub-Saharan Africa end in abortion. So abortion is not rare. Many women you know have had an abortion. You just don't know that they've had one because everyone keeps silent about it. And women stay silent because they are afraid that they will be shamed and judged. Um, So the stigma causes this continued silence, and it relies on this continued silence to exist. If abortion is understood to be what it actually is, an everyday occurrence and a simple safe procedure, then the deviant label attached to people who have had an abortion will collapse because you cannot stigmatize something that is the norm. And can you tell us about your findings on the hostility of healthcare workers towards those seeking abortions? Well, this study did not specifically look at health workers' attitudes, but other research has shown that many healthcare providers, even nurses that do abortions, are against abortion and may try to convince women who come in for an abortion not to go through with it. They might do so by shaming and judging the woman for having unplanned pregnancies, for not using contraception, for getting pregnant when they cannot afford a child. So that rude behavior does scare people off. Studies done at the CSSR have found that religious organizations volunteer to do counseling at abortion clinics in public hospitals, and then their job is to try and persuade women who come in for an abortion against having one. And they do so by using anti-abortion rhetoric, lies, and scare tactics. For instance, they will describe abortion as dangerous, unsafe, irresponsible, or immoral. They might say things like, there is a risk you will never get pregnant again, or there's a risk you will regret your decision and become depressed afterwards. This type of counseling is very distressing for women in these circumstances. Many women going through the process of an abortion are already stressed by the unplanned pregnancy and perhaps the fear that people will find out about the pregnancy or the abortion. So this type of anti-abortion counseling really exacerbates that distress. And lastly, Katrina, what are some of the recommendations in the book with regard to improving access to safe abortions in South Africa? Do you think it's an issue of political will? Fundamentally, yes, it's, it is an issue of political will. There are a lot of things that can be done, and some of them actually quite simple, some of them slightly more complicated. But the first one is straight knowledge dissemination, so that people know what the abortion law is, it's various, and it's not just that abortion is legal, and but also what are the various stipulations, you know. So we have found in some of our research, for example, that people say, oh, no, you need your husband's permission, you know, that kind of nonsense. 
They also need to know where are the clinics, you know, if you need to access abortion, where do you go? What are the procedures? So again, making the procedures, understanding that it's a very simple gynecological procedure, nothing major about it. And then also um, knowledge on evidence-based understandings of the consequences of safe and unsafe abortion. And I mean, safe abortion performed under safe conditions has very low risks, but you know, often there are risks that are associated with it, which just simply aren't true. Of course, unsafe abortion does have some consequences and people need to know the difference between the two. What we found in our research is that our participants said that they preferred non-interactive means of communication. So because abortion remains a bit of a sensitive topic, they like to hear about it via pamphlets or posters or television or radio. So that's important to remember in terms of thinking of knowledge dissemination. And particularly in the rural areas, radio would be seen as, as a very important medium of communication. It's also important, and this is something that, you know, if we go back to our discussion of the global gag rule, that um, through our life orientation, comprehensive sexuality education, one of the difficulties that we've had in South Africa is that our scripted lesson plans that were funded by the USAID does not mention the CTOP Act at all. So in other words, people can go through a whole high school of comprehensive sexuality education without ever knowing the legal status of abortion. Um, so that's really problematic because whatever you do or do not think of abortion, it is the law and people have a right to know what the law is in their land. So knowledge is a big component of it. But then there also has to be, you know, looking at services. So, you know, we need to have integrated services. So you don't have to go to get contraception in one place and then your HIV testing in a different place and your antenatal care in a different place, but do integrate services. And what we recommended is what we call, it in terms of rural areas, at any rate, a catchment area approach. So that you have clinics in the main town, but then you also have outreach into the sort of more remote areas, particularly with mobile clinics and, and partnering also with NGOs. And um, we spoke about uh, staff training to ensure that staff approach abortion or even just uh, requests for information about abortion in non-judgmental and non-directive manners. But to also provide support to staff, because people who are working, particularly who are working in termination of pregnancy clinics, often get very little support and actually get stigmatized themselves by association. Um, so there's a, a big need to support those staff as well. We need community-based interventions to destigmatize abortion, which is, you know, part of what Yolandi was talking about. And there have been a number of very good initiatives by various organizations, both in South Africa and internationally, and there have been quite a lot of reflection on what works. Some of it is people just telling stories, those who have had abortions are telling their stories so that people can develop the sort of empathy and understanding of this, but also stories about the general reproductive environment in which women find themselves. So the argument there is that abortion stories must be understood within the context of stories of reproduction that people go through in general. So, you know, apart from that, we need to make sure that the services are efficient. So we need to increase the number of clinics that offer. We need to make sure that those who can offer do, because we've had a lot of uh, places where there's been, you know, clinics that are designated to be able to provide termination of pregnancy, not providing because they don't have the staffing, they don't bother to replace people who leave, etc., and it's important to limit the number of visits that are required to try to do the service in one day instead of sending people away and having to come back, particularly in rural areas where travel and transport is difficult. And then um, what we've been going on to a lot more and a lot more acceptable since COVID is, is, is telemedicine, telephonic consultations and self-managed abortion. The other one is to extend hours of operating so that clinics are operating in times that are 
are suitable for people. And then also what's important is improving early pregnancy detection because often what happens is that people perhaps only come when they are close to the end of their first trimester or early in the second trimester. And that already now changes. You are now having to do a termination of pregnancy under the you know, different circumstances. You have to go to a different clinic because not all clinics offer second trimester abortion. So if people can detect pregnancy early and, and report to abortion clinics early, then they're far more likely to get the service than if it's already in the second trimester. And you're normalizing safe abortion, raising awareness of the unsafe abortion. Um, part of the difficulty, of course, is that, you know, we have a lot of these posters on walls that advertise the services of illegal providers. And so raising awareness that those are actually illegal providers. So raising awareness of, of the dangers of accessing those providers is important. And politicians speaking about abortion openly and in a positive manner is, I think, important and would help tremendously with breaking the silence and ensuring that people do understand abortion as a very common gynecological procedure and, if done under safe circumstances, is, in fact, less risky than taking a pregnancy to term. There was researchers Yolandi Duplessis and Katrina McLeod discussing their book, Abortion Services and Reproductive Justice in Rural South Africa.